Spiders are the source of a lot of fear and a lot of misunderstanding. Much of this stems from their capability of injecting venom with their fangs. The purpose of this video isn't to necessarily make you fall in love with spiders, it's just to inform you of the pertinent facts and how to safely coexist in our spider-filled world. So, does eight legs always mean spider? No, there's actually a lot of animals that have eight legs. In fact, the spiders are only one of several orders of arachnid, with only the spiders, scorpions, and mites and ticks being medically significant, and the spiders and scorpions being the only venomous arachnids. What this means is that there are several spider-like arachnids out there, but very, very few of them are actually capable of causing you any significant harm. And although they might have frightening looking mouth parts, they're completely harmless. This same sentiment applies to the solifugids or camel spiders who are incapable of producing venom and essentially innocuous. What about daddy long legs? You may have heard some myth claiming they're the most venomous spiders out there, but their fangs are too small to penetrate human skin. This is false for a couple of reasons. Here are three arthropods sometimes referred to as daddy long legs. In fact, the harvestman in the center is not even a spider at all and does not possess venom glands. The cellar spider on the right does, but its venom is not known to be especially potent. Here we have a more detailed view of a harvestman and a cellar spider. An easy way to tell them apart is that harvestmen have one visible body segment while cellar spiders have two, the cephalothorax and abdomen. In summary, harvestmen are beneficial arachnids. They are not pests, they are not venomous, and should be a welcomed guest. Another surprisingly common myth I've heard is some sort of variation on spiders laying eggs underneath human skin or spiders themselves burrowing into skin. Both of these scenarios are impossible. Spiders protect their eggs using silk and either an egg sac or protect their eggs through some other means. Um, also, spiders are not that sclerotized. They're not that tough for an arthropod. So they're um, incapable of burrowing into skin. They're simply not tough enough. Although not a spider, this amblypidget is carrying its young in the way you might see a wolf spider. In short, spiders do not and will not set up shop inside your body. Now, you may have heard something about swallowing spiders in your sleep. This myth is not based in any actual evidence or study as far as I can tell. Spiders really want nothing to do with us. From their perspective, we're kind of like a uh, large, frightening part of the landscape. We are not their prey source. Spiders have evolved to eat other spiders and insects. So the idea of spiders crawling all over us in our sleep and falling into our mouths or biting us in our beds, uh, this is an incredibly unlikely scenario. If you're waking up with sores or bites, uh, bed bugs are a much more likely explanation. In the United States, there may not be a more infamous or feared spider than the brown recluse. And this infamy largely stems from the necrotic properties of the brown recluse's venom. And unfortunately, due to sensationalistic media coverage and general public anxiety, there are numerous misconceptions about this beneficial spider. First is the range of Loxosceles reclusa, which is restricted to an area in the southeastern portion of the United States. Now, specimens may occasionally hitch rides out of range, but they rarely settle or become established. In the four years that I worked in Oregon, not one of the countless spider specimens and photographs sent to me as brown recluse were actually brown recluse. So, how to identify a recluse? The violin pattern is not always a reliable character as this is a common maculation shared by many unrelated species. A much better way to determine if you have a Loxosceles specimen is to look at the eye arrangement of the spider. Although not sufficient for determining species, eye arrangement is actually one of the easiest visual clues for determining which family a spider belongs to. Now if you're considering googling spider bite or already have, here are a few things to consider. That infected thumb picture will show up for just about anything. Camel spiders, again, are harmless. Just because it's labeled a spider bite doesn't mean it's true. Multiple bites means bed bugs or fleas. Two marks does not always mean spider bite. There are a lot of things out there that aren't spiders that cause redness and irritation. Be wary of sensational YouTube videos, and in general, just be cautious about the information you find online. In summary, yes, the brown recluse does have necrotic venom. 
But these are not aggressive spiders and they do not want to bite you. They will only bite if trapped directly against skin. Additionally, if you're out of their range, your chances of an unfortunate run-in are almost non-existent. Another species often blamed for causing necrotic lesions is the hobo spider, Eratogena agrestis, with the specific name agrestis actually being Latin for of the fields and not meaning aggressive. And currently, there's no solid evidence proving the bite of the species to be medically significant. Despite this, dermonecrotic lesions in the Pacific Northwest are all too often baselessly attributed to the hobo spider. Another very closely related species, Eratogena atrica, or the giant house spider, was introduced to the Pacific Northwest from its native Europe. This species also seems to be a source of fear, but despite its large size, it's a completely benign species. Black widows. These svelte, glossy, black and red spiders are feared nearly all over the world. And that ventral red hourglass has become an iconic symbol just about everywhere. Although far apart, the redback spider in Australia and the black widow here in the United States are in the same genus, Laterodectus. And specifically, the females do possess a pretty severe venom containing a neurotoxin causing severe pain and cramping. Despite this, they pose very little threat to humans. Their venom is meant to kill flies, mosquitoes, and other small arthropods. And these shy spiders are very reluctant to bite. A recent study showed that they'll only really bite when directly being squashed or pinched, and these are often dry bites, not venomous. Another closely related theridiad, Steatota grossa, or the false black widow, has a similar but considerably less severe bite. No spider is evil or malicious, or even really aggressive. And simply being aware of black widows is more than enough caution. Moving away from North America, let's talk about some other often feared spiders. First, let's cover the Australian funnel web spiders, who are primarily found along the eastern coast of Australia. Not only are bites rare, there have been no verified deaths from this subfamily of spiders since a effective antivenom was introduced in the early 1980s. As for the Brazilian wandering spiders, they're primarily found in South and Central America, and they have a pretty distinctive defense display. It doesn't necessarily mean the spider's aggressive, it just feels threatened. Once again, deaths are very rare and a effective antivenom exists. Only a small percentage of bites are considered severe enough to even require this. One of the fears with wandering spiders is that they may occasionally show up in shipments of bananas. Most wandering spiders are not medically significant. These are large spiders that are often easily confused with other similar looking spiders uh, like uh, sporacids or lycosids. One way to tell if you actually have a wandering spider is to look at the eye arrangement. It kind of makes a square. Tarantulas are phylogenetically and morphologically really quite different from a lot of the spiders we've been talking about. They're often quite large and hairy, with fangs that hook backwards instead of towards each other. And aside from their urticating hairs, which can really irritate your eyes and skin, they pose no significant threat. When it comes to handling spiders, always let them crawl onto you. Never try to grab them or pick them up from above. If you keep your fingers together and move slowly and carefully, there should be no reason for a spider to bite you, whether it's a Laterodectus widow or a Phidippus jumping spider. Try to present yourself as not a threat, you know, you're just the ground. Why would they bite the ground? And even if they do occasionally jump, uh, it's just what they do. One thing I've noticed with larger spiders, like this uh, net casting spider from Belize, that are kind of ungainly walkers, is that sometimes they will utilize their fangs to stabilize themselves on unsteady surfaces. I even had a black widow female pinch me with her fangs like this, but nothing became of the bite. So there's 46,000 described species of spider on our planet, and probably twice that many out there. And only less than a dozen or so of them are even medically significant. So why do we fear them? They're beneficial to homes and gardens, they're effective pest control of roaches, mosquitoes, other things we don't like. They don't carry disease, they don't kill crops. And with most interactions between humans and spiders, it's the spiders who are the ones that suffer. Uh, they've been around much longer than we have and are part of a delicate ecosystem. Uh, in my opinion, they're not to be feared, but to be respected and admired. 
They represent a vast world of beauty, variation, and fantastic behavior that all too often goes unseen and worse, unappreciated. Thanks for watching. Feel free to leave a comment, and if you'd like to read more about anything I've discussed in the video, I've left some links in the description. Thank you.